Well, isn't this interesting? We're doing a, starting a series on Matthew 24 on uh, March 24th. I didn't plan that. It just happened. It's not the reason for doing it. The reason is that given the times we live in, I think it's a fitting message leading up to Easter. The theme of this message is the theme of Matthew 24. Are we ready for his coming? The entire chapter of Matthew 24 is Jesus' answer to a question posed to him by his disciples after Jesus makes an astounding prediction or prophecy to his disciples. Matthew 24, 1, we see them leaving the temple, the grounds and the buildings, and his disciples are, are admiring the beautiful temple buildings, which are one of the great wonders of the world at the time. In Jesus' day, the temple had just undergone a 46-year remodel or building project by Herod the Great. It had taken that long to complete, 46 years. It literally, as I said, was one of the great wonders of the world at the time and it caught the eyes of the disciples after they're leaving the temple grounds and it remarked at the spectacular architecture before them. Now, I often, when I think about that, I was thinking about the time when I was going down to Children's Hospital and Minneapolis and my first trip to the big city and all the big skyscrapers and I was like four years old and I look up at these big skyscrapers and wow, you know, I was just blown away. Well, this is the way the disciples were when they came to the outside the temple buildings. They saw the beauty of the architecture and they were remarking on that and Jesus' response to them was this. Do you see all these buildings? I tell you the truth. Not one stone here will be left on another which will not be torn down. Now they were, of course, quite astounded by this. The prophecy he made was fulfilled in 70 AD when the Roman general Titus Flavius attacked the city and his soldiers tore down the temple to get at the gold and the walls. They actually stacked wood around the temple buildings and lit it on fire, and when the gold melted, it fell down between the cracks and the stones, and so they pried the stones away to get the gold leaving the Temple Mount in the condition it is today. They threw the stones over the wall. So why would God allow that to happen? He was also always so very jealous for his temple. Well, the temple location had changed. It was no longer needed. No more sacrifice was needed for sin. Jesus was our one and only sacrifice for sin for all time. So that if he had not allowed this to happen, they're still be sacrificing on Temple Mount today. Now they can't. So, as they assembled the Mount of Olives, they sat down with Jesus, and they posed this question. This is a theme of the entire chapter, and it's going to take us three weeks to cover it. In verse 3, he says, Tell us when these things are going to happen, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. You know, aren't you glad they asked that question? Because it's great instruction for us. So we have something to look for to see when Jesus is coming. What is the signs of the end of the age? And that is a question we will begin to answer in the next three weeks. Today we'll focus on verses 36 to 44, in which Jesus says, But of that day and the hour no one knows, not even angels in heaven, nor the Son of Man, but the Father alone. I've heard lots of songs and messages about this verse down to the years. Songs that go like, the Father is standing right now and telling the Son that it's time. Well, we don't know that it's true. We don't know the day or the hour. That is something Jesus makes plain to us. If you want to make sure Jesus won't come back on a certain day, predict, predict that day that he will come back. And it says, assuredly, he will not come back on that day. And you'll be labeled a kook. But Jesus will come back on a day, and will not come back on a day where we predict, because we don't get to make that call. God the Father makes that call. It's up to him alone. Jesus gives a comparison in the next verses about the days of the flood. He said, Matthew 24 for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. 
For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. He is, uh, what is he saying here? Keep your eyes open. Since you don't know the day or the hour, we have to be ready. He's also saying that his return will catch the world by surprise. It should not catch us as Christians by surprise. We're supposed to be watching. We're supposed to be ready. Those who are not Christians will be caught unaware, just like they were in the time of Noah. It wasn't that Noah didn't give the word out. It says in the Bible he was a preacher of righteousness for 120 years. But they were still caught unaware. In Noah's day, life was going on as normal. Getting married, eating and drinking, going to work, tilling the crops, milking the cows, building buildings, making money. The interesting thing about this is even though the flood is scoffed at in our modern times, Jesus gives legitimacy to the flood. And evolutionists don't recognize the geological effects of the flood on our world today. It wasn't just the water came up and then the water came down. It was a worldwide cataclysmic event of, of epic proportions. It changed the entire topography of the planet and the climate of Earth. Continents were moved out of place. Mountains that weren't there before were raised up or raised higher. Seashells are found on the top of mountains. How did they get there? If you ever watch fast-moving water, cut channels in through dikes and through hillsides and things like that, well, that is what happened to the Grand Canyon. It was formed in a year, not over millions of years. Yes, there's been erosion and sedimentation over millennia, but most of the Grand Canyon was formed as the floodwaters drained away. By the way, climate change is going to happen. Just not quite the way some people think. Why do I, what do I mean by that? Second Peter 3.10 says this. The Apostle Peter tells us, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be melted or destroyed with intense heat. Yes, climate change will happen. It happened at the time of the flood. It's going to happen again. The elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and earth and its works will be burned up. Let's continue with Second Peter chapter 3, verses 11 to 12. Since these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? So there's our instruction for living. How should we live our lives while well, we're waiting for Christ to come back? In holy conduct and godliness. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. How can we hasten the coming of the day of God? By sharing the gospel with everyone we meet. You know, that's how we hasten the coming of the Lord. Dan has said it many times. He said, what would it be like to be the last person who comes to faith in Christ before Jesus comes back? Wow. There is someone like that. And Peter will tell us that. Since all things to be destroyed in, way, what, in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because in which the heavens will be destroyed by intense burning and elements will melt with intense heat. This is catastrophic climate change on a global scale. What should we be looking for? Verse 13. But according to his promise, we are looking for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. We know from the Bible, especially Paul's writings, that all creation was corrupted along with mankind. God had to corrupt creation so that the creation wouldn't destroy us. That's what Paul says. We wouldn't be able to survive on this world unless creation was corrupted. Now Peter says everything will be made new. Since the old earth is corrupted beyond redemption, God will make everything new, just like he does for people everywhere who believe in him. 
the old spiritual man is beyond redemption, so he puts that to death and makes, brings forth a new man. That's what happens when we're born again. Where will we be when all these things and this massive climate change happens? We'll be with the Lord Jesus in heaven. How then shall we live until all this takes place? How do we as Christians conduct ourselves in a world, in the world, until Jesus comes for his church, his bride? Verse 14. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found in him in peace, spotless and blameless and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. Peter is issuing a call to believers to be doctrinally and morally pure. There's an article in the Vine and the Branches the newsletter. I don't know how many of you get that. I'm sure some of you do. It is entitled, and I was astounded by this, an atheist minister retains her job. Apparently, there's a church in Canada has a minister who is a self-proclaimed atheist. She is sure that she would have lost her job once she comes out as being an atheist. But the church instead affirmed her, did not fire her, and instead, out of their liturgy, took out any mention of God and Christ. Prayers are now called... Uh, um, I lost my point. <laughs> Prayers are called community sharing time. Hymns were rewritten. References to God and Jesus was replaced with love, compassion, and beauty. It's going to be wonderful, she said. We'll be out from underneath this heavy cloud of historical Christianity. Now we'll really be able to fly. Okay? This is the very thing Peter warns us about. We must be careful to be doctrinally pure and morally pure as Christians. That's how we live our lives. So Matthew 24, 40 to 42. So when the Son of Man comes, he says two men will be taken, will be working in a field. One will be taken and one left. Two men will be grinding in a mill. One will be taken, one left. Jesus is, of course, talking about the rapture of the church. You can imagine the chaos that will happen on earth when millions of people, one-third of the earth's population suddenly disappears. People who are left behind will hopefully pick up our Bibles that we leave and read them. Millions do. We see in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, that there's a crowd of people that no one can count from every tribe, tongue, and language that has come to Christ through the tribulation and washed their robes and made them white. He said, after this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one can number from every tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes white palm with palm branches in their hands. And in verse 13, one of the elders addressed me, that was John, saying, who are these clothed in, in white robes and where have they come from? He said, sir, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They're in heaven. That means they have been martyred for their faith. So our admonition is found in verse 42. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Why do we need to stay awake? Because the cares of the world can dull our senses. We get caught up in things that have little eternal value instead of being doing about the master's business. Jesus gives the analogy in, in, that Peter gave in 2 Peter 3. He says in verse 43, But know this, that if the master of the house had known what part of the night that the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake, and he would not let his house be broken into. So Jesus says he's coming like a thief in the night. You don't know the day or the hour. So he gives us parables to help us understand these verses. It all boils down to being ready for his turn, his return. Verses 45 to 51. And it applies as much to me as to any of you. And to us as leadership of our church, who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? I'm feeding you guys today. I hope you're hungry for more. 
Blessed is that servant whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. The owner of the house here is the person's life. Who is the thief? The one who seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. That is Satan. Remain diligent. Remaining diligent means we'll be at, on alert at all times to the schemes of the devil. One of the verses I quote so often is 1 Peter 5 8. Be sober, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, goes about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Should we fear him? No. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. So many are being caught up in addictions and immoral lifestyles today. You hear it on the news all the time, if you can stand to listen to it. Addictions and immoral lifestyles are being caught up in the cares of the world. When Jesus returns, they will be caught by surprise. I'm reminded of Luke 21, 25 to 29. I shared this on Wednesday night Bible study. There will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and on the earth dismay among the nations. In perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting from fear and the expectation of things that are coming on the world. For the powers of heaven will be shaken. They will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Wow. I'm excited for that time. The disciples were standing on a mount of olives, straining their eyes to get one last glimpse of Jesus as he was ascended into heaven. All of a sudden, two men in white robes stood alongside of them and told them, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into the sky? Oh, I, I want to see Jesus. <laughs> this same Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just in the same way you have watched him go into heaven. Wow. So that's what we'd be looking for, for Jesus to come back with power and great glory. In the end of that verse in, in Luke says, when you see these things about to happen, look up, because your redemption is coming. So that tells me, this at the end of the tribulation, that tells me there's still going to be believers left on earth who are going to be standing there waiting for Jesus to come with raised hands. They will have survived the persecution and rejoice when Jesus comes. I want to conclude this message today from a scripture we had in Sunday school this morning from Titus chapter 2. This scripture gives us all great instruction for godly living. And will help us live our lives effectively as Christians until Jesus comes again. The first instruction is, is first for Titus as a church leader, then to older men and women in the church. I warned our Sunday school class they were going to get this again, so they're not surprised. As for you, he says to Titus, he was a church leader, speak things which are fitting for sound doctrine. We are called to pass on what we have come to know in this Bible to the next generation. That is what we are to do. We are to disciple one another, and we are to pass on what God has given us to the next generation. As a congregation, we need to be discerning and examine what we are taught to be sure we are taught sound biblical doctrine. The next scripture is instruction for older men. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible or, con or self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, in perseverance. Love is the qualifier there of everything. How everything has to be done in love. All this is Christ-like characteristics. Verses 3 to 5, older women likewise are to be reverent in her behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved as much wine, teaching what is good, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be self-controlled, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands so that the word of God will not be dishonored. We want to bring honor to God in how we live our lives. Do we not? I hope you do. Do younger people think you're off the hook? No, not so. Titus has instruction for you. Verses 6 to 8. Likewise, I urge the young men to be sensible in all things. He tells Titus to be an example of good deeds, of purity, of doctrine, dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, 
so that the opponents would be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. Oh, man, that is so wonderful. I, w- I was thinking about Daniel this morning, and, and his opponents tried to find something against him to talk about and to bring him down, and they could find nothing wrong with how he conducted his lives. They couldn't find anything to pin on him. Oh, I would love to have that said about me. Oh, man, that would be great, huh? That you could go throughout your life and people look at you looking to find something wrong and they can't find it. Wow, that would be great. So, <coughs> Purity of doctrine, dignified, sound in speech and beyond reproach. We are called as older people to be examples, Titus says, to our younger people. We are to live by example to them. People watch us. Our young people watch us. Do we live what we say? Do we back it up? The only thing they could find on Daniel is he prayed. And Daniel was, a foolish decree was made to Darius, King Darius, and Daniel. Uh, no one could pray to King Darius for 30 days. And they were set up a trap for Daniel because they knew that Daniel always prayed. So when an edict was signed by King Darius, couldn't be revoked, According to the laws of Medes and Persians, they couldn't revoke a law once it was signed into law. Daniel did the same thing as he always did. When he knew it was signed, he went up to his balcony, faced Jerusalem, and prayed as he always had. Hmm. He was a man of integrity. He conducted his life with integrity. Even when it should have cost him his life, most people thrown into the lion's den did not survive. But God protected him. He wasn't afraid of the lions. He was more reverence of God instead of fear of the enemy. Paul's urging Titus and all of us, and I'll conclude with this thought, to live a life of integrity too. When we do, it shows the community around us that we walk the way we talk. We live the way we should. And I got a ways to go in that. I'm, I'm not perfect in this. I'm, I would like to think that I do better in what I do, but I got a ways to go in this, and I think we all do. But we can learn from this instruction how to live godly lives until Jesus comes for his church. Father, thank you for the instruction, the, the admonition to be ready. To be ready, because you're coming, and the signs are pointing, you're coming soon. It won't be long. And so how do we live our lives? And and Titus gives us great instruction. Matthew gives us great instruction through Jesus that uh, how we can live lives that are pleasing to you and are witness to the community around us. Lord, you placed us here for a reason as a church to live godly lives and and to show others what it's like to really live as Christians. So, Lord, help us to live that out day by day. And Lord, we know you know us very well. We are dust. We fail but you are there to receive us back with open arms and forgive us and wash us clean. So thank you, Lord, for the challenge for us today. In Jesus' name, amen.